and welcome to another episode of our Season 2 of Design Second Life. As many may already know, Season 2 is all about getting more in-depth with the real issues our architecture industry is facing. So we are certainly very excited to have this conversation with our guest today, Abbas Faisi. Hi Abbas, how are you? Hi, thank you for having me. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Welcome to our work podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited. Uh, could you tell us where, where you are from, Abbas, and uh, where you're located right now? Yes, so I am from uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, and I, two years ago mm-hmm. I have moved, uh, moved to Sweden, and I now live in Helsingborg in the south of Sweden. Nice. How's the weather there now? <laughs> Today is very sunny. Yesterday it was very rainy. So each day is different. New stories. (laughs) So before we dive uh, into our conversation, we would like to give our audience a brief introduction about your background. So you are a community and a human-centered researcher. You're a designer and a facilitator with eight years of international cross-cultural management experiences in the MENA region. Sweden and the United States. You also specialize in learning and development, cultural and social innovation, and social and urban change. There's so much to be said about you and the work that you've done, but I think uh, Arizo and I decided to unfold those during our conversation. But if there's anything that you would like to add uh, uh, and let us know about you, please feel free. Yes, thank you. The floor is yours. If you want to, yeah, uh, give, a, give an introduction about yourself, yeah, you can do it now. If not, we can oh, move yeah. on to the questions. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So, as you said, I'm uh, my journey started uh, probably 10 years ago as well. And I started, uh, I was studying architecture at the Lebanese University in in Lebanon, in Beirut. Um, And then from that, I moved into, um, I mean, I don't know if you want to get into this now, but uh, fast forward, I also did a master's in design at uh, ALBA, which is the Académie Libanaise de Beaux-Arts. And my my work has shifted uh, from architecture or how we know architecture into more socially driven urban activism, I would say, uh, with Architects for Change that I started as well in Lebanon, uh, which is a youth-led organization that aimed to connect uh, young architects and stu- students to um, to redefine how we do architecture. Um, and then I worked also on Beirut Design Week, which is a, a national design festival uh that that helps uh yeah national design festival that also helped me <laughs> not only has uh, like as a to grow as well and to understand what does design actually means um because the the this, the festival itself focus on design and social impact on uh, you know design as a process not only as product focus on entrepreneurship on uh providing and showcasing local designers um, through exhibition, talks, workshops, uh, connecting Beirut uh, to other cities as well through design. So it was an interesting as well shifting point. Uh, From that now I'm more, I work in two areas as you described. One is more uh, learning and development and maybe it's not directly related to what we'll talk today but it's also driven by uh, my understanding of design and the second area is more related to urban uh, activism and placemaking and urban research. Uh, so these are the two areas I work in right now and uh, my I work as an independent consultant. I have my Inklit um, firma uh, which is in Swedish it means like a soul uh, sole trade company you know i'm a consultant so i have like my own uh, company and office and i work in projects in sweden in europe in lebanon in cairo different places and 
it's nice because every month I get to work on something different. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. yeah. So that's like a brief. Uh, but when uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk more about the, the journey and whatever questions you have. All right. <laughs> That's so let's cool. dive in. Let's start. Yeah, but it was funny because when when you were explaining like what was the idea behind how you all started, it's very similar to Design to Connect, like redefining how how we we know architecture, like in today's world. So yeah, so I'm excited. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, Abbas, if you wanted to say something. No, I think yeah. I mean, it would be good also to focus on that, like. Um, the way it started for me, it was through architecture school and realizing in architecture school that what we're doing uh, is not enough. I mean, I went to the Lebanese university, which is a public university. Uh, I can generalize, but many people feel satisfied with the education there or feel that it's a good quality. And maybe it is, but for me, there was something missing and something that was not uh enough uh, and you know when you start going outside the borders of university as a you know as a young person because when you start university this is where your personality starts to take shape even before you start work like you start seeing the world differently you're not only going to school you're going to university and then especially when you're architect students you start looking at things and understanding okay what are these things around us um uh, even though we decide to go to architecture school and most architecture schools have, you know, uh, admission exams and it's very hard to get into, uh, but we don't really understand what architecture is until we start maybe in our second year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, during my years, I started also to get involved, you know, with your, uh, with uh, uh, organizations in Lebanon. I wanted to use this, my professional uh, I wouldn't say life back then, like my uh, inspiring role as an architect uh, to use it in this, in social causes. And then I worked with a, or volunteered with an organization called Nahno in Beirut. And we were working on the campaigning on reopening uh, Hirsch Beirut, which is a national, a large park in Beirut that is closed uh, on, you know, campaigning to reclaim uh, public beaches that have been uh, privatized. Um, and then one year in an in a architecture project in the studio, they bring us a, a project and we had to build a design stadium inside the park, which is something we were kind of campaigning for, which is, was a real project back then, um, uh, initiated by the municipality, which was exactly what we were campaigning of. You know, so here, you, you, as a student, you're very young, you don't know, like you, you're trying to shape your personality, you stand in, a, in this dilemma, like, okay, of course I wanna pass and I don't care. And of course, I don't know, I don't know how my teacher think, but at the same time, like, is this really what they are teaching us? Uh, because this is not what I'm st I stand for and what I'm fighting for outside. Uh, so here here becomes here here started uh, my first questioning uh, of things, um, and that's when yeah things started to make more sense. I would say, although they got more complicated. I think we have a very similar journey, yeah. Especially when you're working in a in a I, I mean like you're studying in a and. I don't want to say Lebanon is underdeveloped, but like in a sense it is. Um, and you're going into architectural school for the reason of thinking that architecture is going to be the tool to help you, you know, advance and help your country grow. And then you realize that disconnect between what you're studying and the reality and what they're teaching you. It's, it, yeah, for sure. I was like first year, second year, I'm like, that's not what I signed up for. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's so true. Um, okay, so to move a bit towards the questions that we actually prepared, uh, I I wanted to ask you a little bit about human-centered or people-centered design. 
actually this question came to my mind by reading a LinkedIn post of someone that uh, a woman started talking about people-centered design and then this uh, this guy comes and comments that no we shouldn't do people-centered design because then if we put people on the, in the center then what happens to the environment at the at the beginning i got really angry to this post like to this comment but when i started thinking and especially in, started thinking in the urban scale uh, a lot of times it happens in the cities that when we put people in the center, but also when we talk about, I don't know, affordable housing or housing for homeless people or robust housing. And we try to, you know, make something that is socially good for the society, uh, the material that is used or the process that is used for, for these kind of projects because of the lack of money, lack of budget or uh, the complexity of the issues, it most of the times becomes exactly not environmentally friendly or uh, yeah sustainable so i wanted to ask you how we can take a holistic approach in a people-centered design in a way that we can have a sustainability that is a building that is both environmentally sustainable socially sustainable and economically sustainable yeah yeah i think that's a very uh good question but also like a very big questions uh i think i i mean i like that you mentioned that sustainability is not only about the environment you know it's about the social uh sustainability the economic sustainability that you're trying to create uh, i don't really care i mean i have this title human-centered designer just so it makes sense to what i do but no matter what we want to call it i mean at the end of the day if you are you have human in your in your process if you're thinking about this is for the benefit or based on the needs of the people that i'm designing for then definitely i'm thinking about their safety and their sustainability and the future of where they're living i'm not just answering their immediate need of a parking space no i'm thinking uh, with them on a long-term base what's happening so human-centered design is is definitely it's putting I mean, there are lots of as well uh, methodologies or terms that people would use. Uh, no matter what we call it, it's the idea that if I am a designer, if I'm an architect, if I'm an urban designer, who am I designing for? You know, um, most of the time it's if I'm an architect, one can argue that this is um, we are doing like the architect is just answering the need of the, you know, of the real estate person, like the architect has very limited power, maybe. Uh, one can say that, like as an individual employee, you, you, you don't have much power uh, rather than the big names. And then if you look at urban designers as well, okay, what are you designing mostly for the city or, you know, you're commissioned to do this job by a, a certain authority. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not all it's are you designing from a perspective to answer what needs you know so that's the first question if i'm answering the real estate person is it it's definitely commercial and it's for profit and it's different maybe it's not uh it's not what's what people need at the moment so first yeah thinking exactly who am i designing for the second is the second point would be um uh, how how am I how am I understanding more uh, the people I'm designing for? Okay, because if you if you make any single decision, you know, if you uh, think about architecture and making a window or not in this specific corner of light, I don't know, uh, and think of large scale like deciding if this street will lead to the park or lead to the garbage dump, I don't know. So these decisions that someone a human like you and me make just out of inspiration or you know uh, personal insight leads to to how people live their lives so I, ca I cannot even if i think that i'm a great architect i cannot just decide uh how people will live or uh you know guess assume what people need so this this important part of the need and who am I designing for, I think it does not contradict with 
thinking of the future. As a, as a designer or architect, you come with this technical and you know knowledge and the expertise that you have, and this is what you bring to the table. You bring that with in connection with what is the current challenges. Let's say the current challenge is. Uh, environmental or you know thinking about uh for example waste management in this in this community or in this neighborhood so what i bring to the table is my expertise and then i see with people how i can make this happen and i have to listen uh the process is not easy to implement as we think like it's not only oh i ask two people how do they think about this design and okay that's like i did my human-centered design, it's more complex. So, and it needs a lot of uh, buy-in, let's say from companies or institutions. Uh, and it usually happens more on the, on the non, like, you know, on the non-profit, uh, like in the NGOs or in the community projects rather than it happens in the commercial uh, side. Sure. Because a lot of um, a lot of them would think that you know, like, who's going to be paying for that research, or like, where how is that research part is going to be funded, and it's always going to be tied to the money factor. Uh, so we lose that as we lose that like when we say site analysis or like the analysis, we lose that portion of uh, in our design. Uh, so interesting. Exactly. Yeah. True. Arisu, would you like to add anything? No, no, it's okay. Okay, you can go. On. Yeah, okay. so it's just to like, I would say it's the profit centered that <laughs> uh, contradicts with the uh, environmental centered. Or now they have like this pla yeah. Yeah. <laughs> planet centered something. So it's not the human centered that contradicts with, the, uh, with what, what we need in this planet. It's the profit driven uh, sector. Yeah. Maybe okay, just, so, can I add, sorry. sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, but but uh, sorry, just something that came to my mind. But we can say that for for a project that is uh, initiated by grassroots and by people. But when we talk about like human centered designs that comes from I don't know municipality or government, uh, they they do not consider you know the the same factors. So it's like we try from this side to bring a new you know, idea to the table, but from the other side, again, you know, the, the lack of budgeting, like, destroys the type of building, you know, that, that are being built in a bigger scale, I don't know, from from the side of yeah. government. And but I think there is a huge shift everywhere now. I mean, uh, there's a huge shift in how cities are being uh, thought of and what are being considered and what kind of companies they are trying to work with um, sometimes I think it's pure marketing uh, you know so it's it's in, in these days it's very good for a city to act like this you know it's taking the environment into consideration it's taking the people needs participation place making of course nobody sees if they are doing this right or not it just so there is this trend, and I think as architects or designers who want to do the job right, it's a good opportunity to, um, yeah, to 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 benefit from. Like, okay, let's take this opportunity where finally there is an opportunity, there is uh, people listening to this way of working, uh, and we might uh, react to it. But as I said, there are like tons of examples everywhere in the world where this is uh, this happened or it's currently happening. So I, I don't feel very pessimistic. Um, but in the same time, I know that the profit driven sector is way bigger than, than I, any of us. So it's always about small scale uh, interventions so far. Sure. <laughs> At least let, let's let's put our focus on that. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's interesting that you said that how you feel like some cities are shifting uh, in the way they're developing, and this actually ties to that question. Um, I would like to have your input on because we feel that um, there is 
what we, Arizu and I, we call the Western module of urbanization uh, that's been implemented in like underdeveloped cities or cities that haven't even reached um, industri industrialization yet. So the module doesn't necessarily work with the uh, uh, city or the development of like a certain, uh, certain area. And we feel that one of the issues is that because it's it, it we tied it back to the educational module or the the architectural school or like the the first step when you're studying right it's our we feel like our educational sector is very based on um the western world or the western module so how do you think we can um create a shift or create new knowledge in our approach to urbanization uh, when most of the educational modules that we study are based on um, the Western world, you know, like what, what do you feel are some of the challenges that we should think of um, for us to be aware when we're trying to approach this, uh, this issue? Or to, if we would like to change like some of the um, curriculum in certain areas, or I don't know, from like your perspective on what you do from the learning and development um, side of your career. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when it comes to architecture uh, education, I think one of the one of the researches I worked on while doing my master's is, you know, how to how to integrate ethics. So if I talk about ethics, uh, which is, I think it's a good starting point for architects to think about all the other things, the environment, the people, whatever, just, you know, what kind of uh, it's not only values or morals that I have as a person, it's how, what ethics do I bring to this practice? Uh, and then this could, this definitely need start at architecture school. So if we think about uh, what I mentioned about the park or, you know, other examples in Lebanon where at architecture school, the, the, the teacher would uh, tell you, oh no, you should not put a window for the maid's room, let's say. So, you know, like these small uh, uh, details and examples of what you actually, uh, teachers would tell you is a starting point, okay? Um, and so that's like, I would say integrating ethics and learning about ethics is the first point. The second one is who are our role models and who are the architects we learn about I mean, you have to leave architecture school to learn that Le Corbusier is not that great and he's a really bad urban designer. And I mean, what you learn at school is just that he's great and he has the best building. I don't know. It's just like this. No, yeah, yeah. No argument, no, no depth to what, at, what, at we what we are learning at architecture school. And I think it just, maybe not all, I mean, at least from my education of what I've seen from other people, uh, it's not really rooted in academia or in analysis and in, you know, being uh, critical of what we are learning. It's just like, oh, this is great. Let's have a, a modern glass building. Wow, amazing. This is so cool. You did a great <laughs> render. You know, your sure. architecture school be becomes just, you're doing rendering and wow, you're the better the render you have, the better architect you are. Is that really the case? And unfortunately, this is what the market needs. So I understand where would this come from? Like, why do I need to, re to teach uh, uh, theory and history and be critical? Like nobody needs this. <laughs> At the end of the day, we all want to make a living and practice what we learned. So yeah, so this not rooted in academia and not the role models that we come up with are all Western as well. Uh, and we definitely, if we look uh, in our countries or in our own, uh, we can find a lot of other architects, but we only know, yes, the Western white men. Uh, even if you think about women architects, you, we had Very a project. Rarely at, know any. Yeah, we had a project at Architects for Change where we we actually shoot the like we asked people, okay, who's your uh, female, like, no, who's your role model? Just woman for woman. And then barely anyone come up with a female name or, you know, it's Zaha Hadid. That's also because we learn about Zaha Hadid as a, but who else? Of course, 
recently more uh, people are winning awards that are female. It's now also it could become a trend or but who are really the women architects that are leading? Uh, uh, even though you can see that architecture schools are full of women or females now, but uh, it's rarely that female architects reach senior levels at architecture companies. So yes, so ethics, uh, role models or examples we are looking at uh, getting rooted in you know critical thinking and academia. Uh, yeah, and this 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 all could learn like you know this service. It's called service learning or uh, project. Uh, I mean, what we do at architecture school is basically all project based. But what if we do projects that are real? You know, I mean, we don't have to build it. It's just what if we are designing a building for real people that we actually meet, that we actually talk to? How would that be? Um, and I would think that in Lebanon. In Lebanon's case, exactly, the opportunity to build something social or you know like a, is not really there. I mean, the market only needs residential buildings. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, a school you would work on a school in your life. But if you work as an architect, everything you're doing is re residential buildings that are profit driven. Um, so but when yeah. you say the market, like, you know, like, is this, uh, it, it goes back to the question mark one, you know, it's market versus human needs. So yes, we're, the market is asking for residential, but is, does that mean that Lebanon doesn't have the opportunity or the space to build something else other than residential? It's just like how, like the question is like how it's going to be funded or who's going to be taken no, care yeah. of that? No, when I when I say market, I don't actually mean what is the need. It's not only the need. It's the market is the people who um, who own these real estate companies and they want to build and they want to make profit. Of course, because there is a housing need, but most of the I don't think we have like a housing crisis. We just have expensive uh, uh, housing living living. But I would I think. What I meant here is that the people who control the market are real estate companies and real estate companies build uh, residential area, residential buildings and the residential buildings need architects to build them. Uh, if you want to fund a community center, a theater, all these are public funds usually, uh, or, you know, uh, government buildings, um, uh, even if you're building a culture center, you, a lot of the time these are uh, also like have this, uh, yeah, this public fund or funding from some donors or wherever. It's not really profit driven because if I build a theater, maybe if I build a mall, let's say, yeah, that's a good example of what other options we have. You have a mall, which is also profit driven. Um, yeah yeah it's, it's it's similar to here actually like even in toronto it's like that all all the community-based buildings they have to be funded somehow by the public or the government so you feel that uh, their expansion is very limited of course why else and and that's the difference of what you don't see in lebanon because there is no uh, public uh, money but it's not only public money there is no interest mm. There is no need. And if you think about the park or you think about any other, um, any other, you know, culture space or civic space that we would, or public space that we would need in Beirut. I mean, the city has been developed in a way that keeps the infrastructure of the city. It's based on uh, this invisible lines of segregation whether by sect or religion or political affiliation, uh, the, 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 what do you call the roads, the, the boulevard, the big, uh, the big, uh, just said, what's my then? Oh, the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bridges, you know, like large, yeah. large bridges that, you know, completely cut off neighborhoods from each other, uh, creates this division, uh, 
of course, if you design this city, you don't want to have a public space that bring people together from different communities. And uh, I mean, it's it's a narrative that has been used as well. That we, if you look at the at the Harsh Beirut Park, it's a triangular uh, shape, and on each side of the triangle is a different community and from a different sect. And oh no, we don't want them. We don't want to open it, so there is no tension, no problems. But who said there will be problems? What is this? What narrative are you feeding uh, into people? Like if we have a space to come together, just to you know, it's park. I'm just gonna run in the morning. Uh, we will make trouble. I'm very excited yeah. you said that because like <laughs> one of the questions here ties to this uh, topic. So I'm very excited to get to that part. <laughs> yes. Very interesting. If you want yeah. Adele to directly go on and ask that question till, I mean, now that we are at it and then I can move on to the- To uh, Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. So it's, uh, the, the idea is because um, I feel like I'm very confused at times when I want to feel like I want to do something that's inclusive and inviting to all, uh, uh, to all people, whether like whatever their cultural or religious backgrounds are. Um, but then I feel that, you know, how can you be designing something that's also responding to their uh, cultural or uh, religious needs? So let's say, for example, I, I decide to design and I'm going to use South Lebanon uh, as an example, just because like I know the cultural and religious uh, ties that this, uh, this area has. And, you know, how can you design something that respects the urban fabric of the area, but still you feel like it's inclusive and inviting beyond the religious and the cultural ties to it? I don't know if I made sense. But yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. like, yeah. Like, how, how do you start looking beyond that? How can you start looking like, you know, as an urban designer, as an architect, that you're designing something that's going to be respectful, but in the same time, inclusive to all? Yeah, but maybe I can say controversial things here, like what is respectful to what and why and why, why? just how Lebanon is that it's so divided. Like if people live in that area, like I'm not gonna go build a club in in South Lebanon because nobody would use it. Let's assume because of religious religious uh, behaviors or beliefs. Okay, but okay. on the other side, so that that is we are here responding to the need of the community. But otherwise, I'm not building a club so people from other cities come there. But maybe I can build it in Sur, which is more diverse, and I would cater more for a diverse community. Otherwise, it's just the way things in Lebanon are. I don't think it's ideal nor uh, a good example to follow. But uh, let's say in Beirut, which is very diverse, you would see a, a mosque and a club, a bar facing each other or like, you know, in a very small proximity, uh, which, I, which I think that's what you like. That's what I think it would be the biggest um uh like differences between these between what is religious and what is not um yeah so but i don't think it's a it's a, it's a good example to follow because if you have a good law and you have governance or policies and and human uh, human rights and freedom of expression these things should not be taken into consideration like if i don't want to go to that place i just don't go i mean okay. And if I'm designing something in that place, that's when I would say like, it's this, sorry, it's this decision to, when I made this decision to build this or to design this, am I, who, whose need I'm, am I answering? You know, this is where it, it will make sense or not, not if these people like it or not, or, uh, and sometimes in these cases in Lebanon or other Lebanon, yeah, you would, you would just need to, uh, avoid trouble and conflict and not not do something that is uh, that would make trouble for people so and then in this case I would respect uh, the decision but in other cases I mean an example we were doing here in, in Sweden and um, there was an artist that is 
doing, if to, I mean, it's part of the placemaking project as, as it's a public space and we're trying to uh, have a, a exhibition. There was a photographer doing exhibition and some, some photos were uh, exhibited were a bit, uh, I would say like, not even nudist, but they had like, it's more like it's female photographers. They were self-portrait. And we saw that the stack, the few days later, the photos were vandalized. Um, so here it becomes a problem because if I am exhibiting these things that of course might not uh, fit everyone's view in this area, who has the right to say no and yes to something? Yeah more complex than we think <laughs> yeah 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 because like even here like for example you know like sometimes um when we're working on projects we think of the area for example like if i'm designing in a certain uh city i know that the demographics for example are mainly asians so a lot of the building and the way that we design is geared towards that and now and now and it, it raised that question to me is that you know like is that right that we do that? Like, is that right that, for example, now I know that there's a community here that's been developed and a lot of Muslims live there. Should our designs for how we do the interiors respond to, you know, some of the um, um, cultural, because of like, for example, the washroom should be designed differently, the separation of spaces will be differently. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a challenge in my mind, in my thinking, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. No, definitely. I think it's about the motivation behind that decision. Are you doing it really because you know that this is the need of the people or you're doing it because you want to make sure you sell the apartments? Mm. Both are, are valid. Yeah. yeah, both are valid. But at the end of the day, you are catering for Muslim families that you know will live in this area. So why am I going to build something that is completely... Uh, not useful for them if you it's it's all about the target because you are building a bill you are designing a building that will accommodate muslim families in that case you cannot bring asian design elements into that you have to follow what these people uh start and this is where you start this is exactly like it's a very good example because you are strictly following their their need and uh, Mm -hmm. uh, what they require yeah but wouldn't that like stop us from change into having more diverse cities like if we go on like this we will always have neighborhoods that only accommodate center certain type of communities and we have these little cities within a city uh so yeah i don't know how how can we yeah, that's the challenge, right? Between like, how can you be inclusive and respectful to, mm. to those things? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but, th that, but that's different levels, I would say. Like, uh, you know, yes, the architecture level is this small uh, intervention that if I am a Muslim family, I cannot have like wide open glass windows all over my apartment because let's say in the case, uh, the, the, my mom is wearing a hijab. She cannot just have these windows. It's it's very useless for her. Okay, uh, and then if I am designing and, and the target, because at the end of the day, when you design accommodation or residential building, you are profit driven and you are trying to sell and accommodate for a certain client uh, group. But then what happens that, yes, maybe I should on, a, on, a, on another layer, which is the urban, maybe I don't have to put five of these buildings next to each other. Then here I'm creating um, an enclave. So I would think the need on a city level is a different of the need on an accommodation level. Like what, what kind of living space I want to be in is different from what type of city I want to be in. And then segre segregation and communities, it's, <laughs> that's like a very big, big, big topic. I think it's, it has a lot to do with the, usually with the history of the cities uh, and how people, you know, moved there and what happened and the policies and the schools and the, the income. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's interesting that we reached this point because it exactly connects to the next question. So I'm happy how naturally the conversation is going today. So uh, yeah, exactly what we were, what you were saying on that architectural scale and then on the urban scale, like most of the t- changes that are happening in in our cities today are either you know top down our approach and they're from they're initiated from government or from the municipality. And then uh, I'm, I'm talking about urban change. So the other urban change is from grassroots projects and it's people initiated. And like, how can we balance these two, you know, and make them work together, meaning to have more people-centered approaches in a top-down approach and a more systematic approach when it comes to people initiated designs or grassroots designs. Because if these two entities stay separated, we will never reach to a change because they will never communicate with each other. And each of them will go on their own way. The grassroots will just stay as some small projects around the city, just, you know, it will be a feel good project within the city. And then yeah. the, the top down approaches uh, will not know what is the need of the the people who are living in that city. So how can we balance these two uh, systems that are going on in, in our cities yeah. right now? Yeah, I like also, I agree with you that you said balance because it's not one or the other. Uh, I would definitely, of course, advocate for bottom-up approaches, but we know that this is not reality and not what's happening. Um, I think if you go back to education, that's a good start to to start the conversation about what needs to happen on a city level. Um, uh, in countries where you actually vote uh, for your city mayor and city council, and when that actually make a difference, this is all where you start making influence in what is happening in your city. Uh, this is not the case everywhere, but. I'm saying in the cases where this is this could be helpful. And I think it's also uh, it's it's also, I mean, the grassroots have a role of advocacy more than uh, it really depends where as well. But let's if I took at the case of Beirut, this was also my thesis topic about uh, urban activism and how what does this initiative do? And what I realized in the case of Beirut, a lot of things are just raising awareness that you have a right in your city. Uh, you have a right to transportation, to uh, housing, to uh, public space, to uh, facilities, um, to protest. All of these are your right, and these are all manifested in your built environment that is around you. So the idea to people understand that my built environment affects all these things, lack, people lack it on many places. So the grassroots could help in this, in these small scale uh, changes. Um, and they are not sometimes t- tangible, uh, you know, physical or built um, changes. And then, yeah, <laughs> I don't have a, like an answer for that. No, you no, just no, feel sure. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I hope that, yeah, small, I mean, they saw, they talk about the ripple effect and the, uh, you, you, you have, you hope that one, one uh, small action, another small action would eventually lead to a bigger, uh, bigger action. And I'm sure as well, there are a lot of examples in the world, um, also, uh, I forgot, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, the idea of a system and there's a concept in design called wicked problems mm-hmm. and wicked problems is usually something that, you know, it's not really solvable and to solve that you have to solve another problem or solving it would reach, will lead to another uh, problem. Let's say traffic everywhere, car, like congestion, it's, it's a very big, it's not like there is no one size fits all uh, uh, solution. So yeah, looking with a systematic 
uh, lens to things and understanding how things connect, how migration connects to housing, to uh, to segregation, to economic, to politics, uh, how all these connects each other in a city and how um, you cannot solve one and just imagine everything else will be solved. They are very interconnected. So true. Yeah, so true. Yeah. And the yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up uh, with, with that question. Uh, talking about partnerships now, like with sustainable development goals are also so much talk about partnerships. And it's, I mean, we talk about partnerships as the main way, you know, to bring the different actors in a city or even between governments together and like create changes. I agree that partnerships are good. They're really good, but um, another, another solution maybe could be that instead of, not that, you know, not that we shouldn't have partnership, but then next to the partnerships, maybe we could have people in each, let's say level with interdisciplinary knowledge, because until like, even if we make partnerships now, between the different levels, there is so much separation that even the language that is used is different. A person in a in a grassroots project doesn't understand what the government say and also vice versa. So how can we have you know people with interdisciplinary knowledge in each level that you know connect these different levels together next to the partnerships? So <laughs> I don't know. So it can it can create a I don't know. Or what could be a, a proper way uh, for better communication between different levels? <laughs> that's that's exactly what's the role of the designer. So that's okay. like the if you are talking about this, uh, what we're trying to say is that we're trying to partnership and collaborate and co-create together uh, a better solution future whatever you want to call it it's about coming these different stakeholders and this idea of co-design is giving the designer architect whatever uh, a different hat you're not you are bringing your expertise you are bringing your knowledge but you're also kind of facilitating this process between uh, between people and that's where design design research, social design, co-design, all these uh, practices came to be. Uh, so it's, it's, it's about having that role in the team or in the project or in the process. It's not about the title, it's having that role of connecting the dots of, you know, having the right tools to use, the right, designing the right conversation, uh, looking at things from a system uh, a system view. Um, and when you mentioned the SDGs or these interconnected problems, I think it's important that, like if we're talking about the urban space right now, it's important to give everything an urban lens as well. Like, you know, so if we talk about education and access to education and education quality, we cannot disregard uh, the urban fabric or where does where do our schools exist where do our universities exist uh, how do i have access to these um, if i live in a, a neighborhood full of immigrants the school is usually not that good why is that uh, so it's related to the housing and the economic uh, situation so the partnership here is if I am someone working completely on education or working completely on environment, I cannot disregard the physical and the built and the urban fabric that is around me. Uh, this is not just like an intangible thing happening. I have to think about everything else. Uh, and this is exactly how we are living, where we are living today and how these conditions affect these problems. So. This is where I see also what you like this partnerships happening between different sectors and connecting to this idea of the urban, um, the urban environment we live in. Yeah. But then shouldn't we as architects have also 
uh, more knowledge maybe on policy and also on what's happening on the street level i mean if we are if we are the actor that is connecting the different levels together shouldn't we have i mean in our education system shouldn't we get educated both on what's happening on the top and also what's happening on the ground next to the I mean, design okay. now if I want to be very radical and anti-architecture, I mean, I would say, what is an architect and why do we still need architects? We don't need architects. There's a lot of architects. Uh, or we have to dissect this definition of architecture. Because right now, I mean, it will come this way that people are just coding and you have a building or you have a design and it's... A lot of things are changing with the technologies and a lot of places, the architect is just like a technic, not a technic, a drafter who is working on, which is not wrong, but let's not, let's dissect. So I am as an architect, if I have all this ambition and I want to do something different, I will end up at a company where I'm just, you know, rendering or doing their AutoCAD files. And all this thinking and ambition is, is, is gone. So I think we need to, that's that's bigger than me to say but you know <laughs> like deconstruct uh what architecture is and how uh what can we do as architects and what are the different options a lot of people especially in the last few years or the people i met not a lot of people like most of the people i've been met in the last few years especially through architects for change many ended up leaving architecture or uh, not practicing architecture. You have people practicing wedding planners. Um, well, yeah, I can't remember what else, but which is good because architecture give you that opportunity and give you the a different set of schools, especially in the school. But once you enter the workforce, the workplace, things really shift really badly. And it's either you, yeah, get yourself up or... Yeah, you're it gone. starts with an, an individual. Uh, true, it's it's based on like what the individual wants to make a change or not. You know, like it just takes us to do that first step um, to shift things. Yeah, and also architecture school should make architects more humble, more down to earth, remove this ego and this superiority. That, uh, yeah. This, yeah. And you see this everywhere, but maybe also in Lebanon, it was, you know, it's your, you have to, uh, I mean, in general, in Lebanon, our identity is made up of, because we, we have an identity problem or crisis, is made up of what, what we work with or what we studied. It gives us this status in the society, because otherwise, who are you? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're already struggling with your religion and sect and political identities and or they are given to you. So it's and everyone wants you to study engineering or architecture or um, medicine, medicine or, or <laughs> law, you know, so it's, it's very. So, yeah, I'm studying architecture. I'm an architect. So it give you that ego boost. But oh, my God, okay. that was deep. What? Uh, like, I, I have tears in my eyes. So. That, that touched me in a, in a bad way. <laughs> yeah. Because it is a challenge to let go, you know, and, and I was honestly just telling Aries too, and I, I am putting my mind and my thoughts for, on pause for the summer because like, I'm like, I'm so tired of thinking of this, but it's like, how can you let go of something that you feel like you've invested so much in and so much of your time and your career to, and then all of a sudden you feel like it's, you know, it's so against your values and your ethics and or what you believe in. But at the same time, it's like, you know, that idea that I'm, I dreamt to be an architect and now I'm like letting it go. But it's it's the, what you said is that, you know, redefining what architecture is, um, I think that would be the first step for me. Yeah, because because yeah. This, this, this innocent architect dream in us like I, I i was building lego houses since i was seven you know and this obsession i mean i didn't understand i didn't know that i have to go to architecture or i didn't really understand what is civil engineering and architecture so it's just this uh, it's this innocent i would say yeah this innocent ambition inside of us that 
that wanted to be an architect even now and I, I faced a lot of problems to finish my uh, degree and it's been a very tough journey and, and sometimes you know when I'm I, I still sketch or do and then I feel like oh yeah but then I realized but I will never be able to do this I will never to be able to practice this love that I have for or like what I imagine being an architect is so I just put it on the side and I know that I'm using that in different uh, in different ways and if you are lucky and you start working as architects and specifically in the case of Lebanon you are someone who comes from a economic and social background that allows you to start on your own whether through connections or investments or money that you have uh, yeah so it's it's yeah we can put that uh, architect ambition into a nap and let it do <laughs> something else. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to uh, shift our conversation to a little bit off tangent, uh, but um, we both are very curious to know your perspective on this as a designer, um, and especially that you have some background um, in urban design. So, in a lot of cities, especially in the Middle East, you know, during the revolution or during like the uprising of the uh, the people wanting to change, they used to gather in a lot of urban plazas or like in a certain area that became known as like the revolutionary circle or that's where like, you know, um, I don't know, like just a circle that's known to connect those people that are going against the system. And we also know that there's a lot of like urban plazas that you would find like statues or like memorials of the past. Um, so there's a lot of history that um, is kind of interconnected with this area. So what's your perspective on such urban plazas and circles that in, in the way of how the city is going to develop? moving forward like do you think that we should be maintaining those past and historical events and creating such areas to resemble them and do you think that giving an urban plaza that idea or that definition of like a revolutionary circle is healthy for the urban development of the city yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I, 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 I wouldn't have a strong opinion about it, but I would just reflect with you on it that I think definitely it's, yeah, recently I've been interested in, you know, dictatorship and urban planning, you know, like mm -hmm. how, how does that happen? Um, then I, I would say uh, in, in some cases, you know, uh, countries or governments will decide to remove that meaning, that collective memory of a certain space by, you know, redesigning it, rechanging it, making massive changes just to remove that memory. So when that happens, I would definitely say no. In other cases, let's say in, in the case of Beirut, I mean, Marty Square has always been there, has always, it's super undeveloped. Anyway, so it needs development. Uh, the memory of 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 uh, how how it's gonna be uh, how the history of it yeah needs to be definitely uh, preserved in some way. But I, I don't know how. Uh, but also, when the protests were happening, and at the beginning we were going to to university, and I was working on my uh, uh, masters and. I started to, I wanted to talk and go into, you know, theory. And I was talking to my professor, like professor, okay, how people are reclaiming places and what's happening. And he told me, can you like, shut up a little bit, uh, put all these theories aside and bring all the photos, the photos that you just took uh, or that you've seen on the internet, put them and see what's happening in the photos. Like there is no need to understand beyond, you know, how does social movement start and how do protests happen? You just look at how people are using public spaces and you can, you can come up, okay. Oh, so people reclaim uh, public spaces or they reclaim public spaces in Beirut by, you know, painting, by visiting the egg that has always been closed, by going into cultural centers that have been 
completely destroyed. Um, people have made up uh, markets and uh, food kiosks everywhere in the city center where it's super expensive. Uh, people, people are gathering. I mean, these things that you see, that you see in your eye and the things that happened and by having these photos taken and by understanding and doing this very, I would say, basic analysis, you know, based on your observation and the photos. Uh, it's not that deep to 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 um, to preserve. But then next, what would happen and what would the government do? I really don't, yeah, don't have much like a strong perspective on that. I would just say that definitely uh, plazas and uh, urban places, urban like public spaces, centers, squares are very important for different things, not only for the protests. So how do I allow access to these? Am I allowed to make a market in Martyr Square? Yeah, <laughs> maybe sometimes, but not. it's not that accessible. So I would say making a public space accessible uh, for people is is what is important. Whether I want to protest or I want to make a party uh, or I want to pray. So these are different collective memories that I can make in a, in a, um, in a space. And then the political power comes and then say, no, we want to remove all this collective memory. But do you think those collective memories will affect the, the evolution of the city of, of how like, you know, like, I'm just wondering if someone is, and I'm using this as an example just because I'm familiar with it, but like I know a lot of uh, urban squares here even in Canada that were destroyed after because they have like uh, a resemblance for like uh, certain people that came over and took over indigenous lands. So I, I, I see, I, I'm seeing it here as well, but you know, like let's say I'm anti-revolution person and would I want to live around that area? Like, is it gonna effect from a development standpoint how we give those urban plazas identities the, the, the development of the city yeah it's how you brand that area and what do you what what what's happening i mean it definitely affects so if i it's all about who's in charge as well like i can't tell you that it's people who's gonna decide uh, it's who's in charge and who's deciding and what type of identity do you want to give these uh, these places? As you said, so if I am a, a right wing, uh, uh, you know, party taking charge of the city, I'm just gonna keep that, uh, you know, that place because for me it's not wrong. It's yeah, we can live on it and make profit of it. If I am very ashamed of everything as well, which is I think could be a problem sometimes, you know, also try to hide this, but how can I use that memory into something positive or into something sure. impactful? Uh, or you know why? Use, you know? True, because like I like my thesis, um, I was doing like the urban development of Khanda al Ghamir, right? And this street has such a historical and such a literate, like it's a, um, like if you think about what that street the identity that it had from the past was very uh, powerful. And now I look yeah. at it now and it's like, you know, I, and I'm seeing how it's affecting the urban development of the whole area because of that street. So I think that's where I'm like, you know, is it, how can we revive um, historical memories in such, a, in such areas? Anyways, I think I took, took us to another off tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> My thoughts uh, just got mixed up. <laughs> it's it's interesting, but uh, I would say it's this. I would take you back to this prophet because what's happening in Khanda Al Ghami is this tension between uh, what is solidaire that is very adjacent, adjacent to it, and then what is Khanda Al Ghami with its very popular uh, and it's still before where solidaire is was very similar to Khanda Al Ghami, just solidaire that's trying to eat things up. Plus political things and layers of uh, no no laws of heritage protection, uh, um, law enforcement in specific areas. Maybe some people are also like not law, <laughs> you know, not no need to enforce the law. But you know what I mean. There is no safety and security, uh, regardless of how we want to achieve that. 
in order for people to access places, we need safety and security. Uh, how is that achieved? I will leave that to the people who are more knowledgeable of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. would you like to add any comments? No, I was just listening. This was cool. <laughs> yeah. I so. Now I want to go go check those places that you talked about. Yeah, I feel Where like Lebanon from? should be a case study. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm from Iran. Oh, nice. Yeah, we are oh. a bunch of Middle Easterns living in West. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Iran yeah. is super interesting as well. Have you ever been there or no? No, no, I wish. Maybe yeah. soon. Yeah, I have After. a lot of uh, Persian colleagues and like everyone is from a different city and then I see pictures and I'm like, because we have such a negative connotation in our minds to because of the political regime, I'm like, is that Iran? Like, it's so beautiful. So such beautiful, beautiful yeah. photography. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. I miss it. And the food. <laughs> okay, I think our, I, I love Lebanese food. So, so. I, I haven't yeah. eaten so many, but... The ones I ate, they're good. I did once, once you come here and you cook me some. <laughs> For sure. Would love to. Are you in different cities? Yeah, we've never met. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where, she lives where, in where? Milano. I live in Toronto. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I thought she also <laughs> lives in Canada. No. 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 You we met on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, okay. anyways, I guess this uh, reaches, uh, we reached the end of our uh, episode. Um, we would love to know if you have any final thoughts or any final comments. And uh, if, you know, like, how can we follow up with you? Um, if someone is interested in your work, like, how, how would you like people to reach out to you if uh, they're interested to know more about you? Yeah, it's very easy. My website is my name. Abbasveti.com, which is A B B A S S V E I T Y.com, or on LinkedIn. I'm happy, yeah, to always connect with people and discuss things. Well, thank you. That was such an interesting, delightful conversation. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank really you. Good it. luck. Thank you, Abbas. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.